I'm going to just do the intro. Um, uh, before we introduce ourselves personally, I want to do a bit, a bit of an intro to the actual talk itself. So, narrative games, you're all here because you're interested in narrative and narrative technology. And the more and more games coming out now show that there is a market for this. In the free-to-play market, you can tell which one I created, right? Um, <laughs> in the free-to-play market, in the AAA market, narrative is key. So what, we, what this whole sort of presentation is about is contrasting and compare our different systems, because both of us have very different approaches. Sometimes we'll agree, sometimes we'll disagree, and we both kind of move with it different ways. And we thought it would be most useful for you guys to kind of have that feel as we go along through the speech. Bit of a disclaimer, we've been working from multiple time zones across multiple worlds while traveling all around the shop. So this is a bit of an off-the-cuff, off-the-fly thing, so there'll be a lot of more improv, a bit more humor. Um, <laughs> so we'll see how we go. But now we get on to the... You are supposed to press return. Oh, wait, oops, sorry. I was, we're doing some de testing to see if uh, all of the various buttons work. So who are we? I'll hand it off. It return works. Okay, which one of these works? Okay, I can just stand here? Yes, okay. you can. All right. Hi, thank you all for coming out to our chat today about pixels and words, sort of, sort of the bite-sized bits of games, but more importantly also in narrative games. I've been in game development for about 17 years. I had experience in EA. I survived probably two of the biggest meat grinders in this industry of Electronic Arts and Zynga, but we all have our own experiences and we can commiserate later. But for me, it's really important to see how story goes into games. I love shoot 'em ups I love blow 'em ups but I also love stories. And I also like seeing what's possible in bringing stories into games. So, um, and most recently I started my own company called One More Story Games. I'm wearing some branding here, why not? And uh, I created a graphical GUI-based WYSIWYG interface for creating narrative games. And I've had a great deal of success in teaching non-technical people how to create their own interactive story games. So, okay. all right, I'm going to try that one. Okay. Ah, yes. So, uh, for those of you who don't know Ham already, um, I'm a, one of the technical project leads at Hipster Whale. Um, I have worked on a bunch of different titles, and some of them in support roles, some of them in full development roles. Um, I have been in the industry for six years. Um, I've mainly, as you can see, free-to-play and games as a service, so a lot of my stuff later will come and be advised by that. Um, I write fiction in my outside work time. Um, so when do you get time to do that? I don't sleep much. Okay. Um, but also, I'm working currently on an unannounced narrative title, and as part of that process, I have been going through all of the tools. I have been interviewing writers. I've been working with writers. I've been exploring ways of creating narrative, trying to find the best way that suits us, and so I'll be exploring some of that technology today. So I can't tell you what it is, but I can kind of tell you how I'm doing it, so yay! Sweet. So the next sort of topic we wanted to cover is how you easily create game content where choices impact the story. Hello. And there's lots of problems when doing this. And this list is sort of a little bit out of order. I might have replaced or reworded stuff and that. But, I mean, whenever you create a tool, um, you want it to be maintainable. You want it to be easy to use. And you want to be able to debug it, especially once you sort of go live. That helps you with the crunch, those crunch periods. Now, with any kind of narrative game, localization is something you're going to have to keep it in the back of your mind. So that's one of our topics that we hope to get to if this works well. But, and, and it's not so much that it's non-programmers who are doing the story creating, it's just you generally don't want your programmers doing the storytelling of the game creating. So, I mean, it depends. It's sort of that right brain, left brain thing that happens. But I think where it, the essence of the problem comes in, in how you create this kind of content, is that you're going from a rules-based, algorithm-based system of code to non-linear storytelling. How do you manage that and how do you, you know, wrap your head around being able to check all of these different avenues to provide choice to your players that creates meaningful stories? So that's where we're going to be going as we frame our discussions and our two different approaches. So my, my answer to this question is it's not easy. 
um, Ed, that, that it's not. I, I didn't say that. No, no, no you no. didn't say that. I, I'm going to prophesy that it's not easy. Um, there are ways to help facilitate development as an engineer, um, and a lot of these things are you'll you'll know is fairly similar. You know, it's reuse of content, so things that you can reuse and repurpose in different ways and then reducing the amount of new content required to be built. So how you can construct systems to automate and systematize some of the stuff. So if any of you were in my data systems talk yesterday, you'll, you'll know that I'm a big fan of automation. Um, and so part of this relies on it. So this, this, this content is kind of built on that, and I'll talk about that in a bit. But the most, this is, this is what I'm excited about. Yeah. So how does story matter? How do you make the impact impact? I didn't know how you read that because it looked like a typo at first. But it was, no, it works out. It's a, if the George and Gracie pattern gets annoying, let us know and we'll, we'll stop. Just groan, okay? So for me, it's going back to the basics, and that's the sort of the title of this talk. It's words and pixels. How do you bring them to life? How do you put words into your game? What are the elements that are going to form that story? And I always like to start as a writer is going to nouns and going to verbs. Are there any Schoolhouse Rock fans in the audience? Yes? No? I know it's not an Aussie thing. It's ask your North American friends. It's a big thing from the 80s and 70s. Um, yes, and you can even sing those songs. Um, so starting with the basics of what is your noun of your story. I mean, the people, the places, the things. This is actually also a very good exercise for game design. What are the nouns of your game? What are the verbs of your game? What can you do in your game? And it's a great way to sort of break down and analyze all of the things that you have to do. But for my case, as building a storytelling tool, it's looking at the people. Who are the, who are the playable characters? Who are the non-playable characters? How do you, the places, how do you build up your world? How is everything linked together? Um, how are you able to move around and do things? Uh, things, speaking of things, Having an inventory system is one part of that, but it's also just what are the objects that you interact with in the world, and that can be very broad. And then, kind of to go beyond the nouns, it's like there's everything else, because a game is kind of keeping rules, it's keeping track of what the state of the game is. Uh, there might be events in there that maybe you have to deal with, but I mean, that's a great way to sort of start in terms of people, places, things, just in terms of telling a story. And what we find for non-writers is that's also very helpful too because that's how they're thinking in terms of forming their stories. What are, who are the main characters? What are the props in that story? Where are the locations going to be? So that's a great way to do simple narrative design. Now, because world building is kind of involved, I wanted to at least break this down a little bit in terms of my approach because we're dealing with the narrative games, but it's also point and click. And there's a lot of different ways you can organize and, and construct a world out of that. So what I call a city, and this is screenshots actually from Story Stylist, um, that is where you might have an image where you have point locations on it. So it's some place where you can explore, um, if you've ever played the game Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, it's where you're moving from location to location <coughs> trying to figure stuff out. So in Story Stylist, it's very easy to create these kind of point-based location systems that you explore. There's also, when you have a, a top-down, it's when you're exploring a map. You're exploring, say, a dungeon or a building. Um, you can even turn stuff off in terms of you explore and slowly show more of the map, like Fog of War type things as you explore. But to be able to build a location like that, you need rooms. You need something to get between the rooms, so you need doors. And then usually there's something to click on. We call those hovers because you can hover over them, get more information. But in, in trying to build up that design, people start to get that, especially if you've seen like your D&D maps where you just want to draw and scan them in. So it, that gets a lot of fun to create and click. And then I also have something called point of view, which is essentially like mist. It's it's not like the others where there's point locations or where you're exploring rooms. It's each shows you a point of view of your location. And then once you have that image, how do you make that clickable? Where do you explore from that? 
Now, that's not narrative per se, but it's showing you and building up the world where your story's going to take place, so it brings it to life for you. So, after nouns, what was the other thing we wanted? What was the other thing we wanted? That's no, no. Verbs, there we go. So, what do we do with, with our objects in the world? Well, we want to talk to people. We might want to fight them. If you have this world, you want to explore it. You want to, you know, go from place to place and maybe even manipulate it to some degree. If you have any kind of inventory all the way back from the Zorks and so on, I put that in there for you. Uh, you want to be able to pick up objects, drop them, use them, combine, and that's all possible within story stylus. And then if you have all of this extra information and backstory that you put in, you want to be able to give something to the user where they can under or read through that information easily, like a notebook, a journal, something else like that. And so these are all the things we try to do with the story stylus and story worlds um, way of solving the problem. And it will sort of get to her solution in a second. So once you've got all of those concepts, my particular solution was, okay, well, let's create an editor that's easy to use. We, and so that's called Story Stylus. That's where you can go online, you can create your story, do it in such a way where you build all of those elements and then link them all together. And then when you're ready, you can go into another app, Story Worlds, where it reads that data and you can play your game and sort of see where the state of what it is that your, uh, your creation, how your creation is going along. But keeping the two separate because players don't always want to see what you're authoring and you want it to be simple enough for them to go in and just view your content. And then with the idea that there are people that just might want to be hobbyists, there might be people who just want to not necessarily, just create stuff to promote another some of their content. Like they might have a book that's coming out with writers or maybe you're just fooling around and just promoting some content. And then we seriously want to investigate how do storytellers get paid? And what we try to do is build a marketplace right into story world so that you can purchase content or even tip the creators so that they continue to be storytellers and, and go from there. It's like Steam, but it's distinct from that. It's, it tries to put everything together so that we can manage and maintain that and um, build that marketplace in so that writers don't have to worry about creating their own apps or getting licenses to publish to iTunes or what have you. So that's my particular solution, and I'd like to hear about Anne's solution. Okay, so I've gone a very kind of different angle for this. I've asked myself... When I'm building this system, what makes something impactful? What is the impact? And for me, there was kind of two categories. There's major. So these are the branches in content where you basically go vastly different content based on choices or actions and those sorts of things. And then there are minor. So they're often subtle changes to you know, the actual story itself. They colour someone's experience. And they can be you know, objects and places can kind of shift around, references to past choices and decisions and actions, um, reflecting on relationships with other characters. It's one of the things that I really enjoy looking at is exploring how do you reflect a changing relationship with another character through a systemic approach. So... Now, I use a couple of sort of bits of technology to this. I use the persistence, which is the data we evaluate against. I then use rules, triggers, and actions to build from that. Rules are the if, triggers are the when, and then actions are the what. And so all of that sort of flow in my narrative technology comes around an if, when, what. And from that point, with persistence, I have a number of different things. I have the individual choices made. So I, as people I've talked to about my data system, I tend to store choices in a very succinct format. I have a very a, a string ID system, which is kind of short and sweet. And so I can evaluate based on any choice that the player has made throughout the entire game. I then go, okay, player statistics. So sometimes what you want to do is, you know, for instance, if you're playing those sort of oh, Dragon Age, are they an angry character? Are they a hostile character? Are they a jokey character? Are they a snide character? How are they playing their roles? Those statistics and those player sort of personality choices, what are they and keeping some sort of record of them? 
I then also have variable values. So things that may not necessarily be the choices themselves, but are things that you change along the way. And often they're things that you will add up, similar to, to statistics, but they may be single instance or they may be long-term saves. So think about that. Key trigger points for me are choices, point of view changes, you know, or character changes. So, you know, you can kind of play around with that. And those are the key points that I go, they're trigger points. They're things where you can start really exploring and changing things. You also have paragraph, scene, or chapter changes. So, you know, places that go next paragraph, next scene, next chapter, anywhere there, they're, they're key trigger points where you can start evolving the narrative based on previous um, choices. So data actions. Um, this is kind of starting to get a little bit into the things. I use polymorphic objects that rely on a common perform action function. So any place in the story where a data action can be applied, any data action can be applied there. So we go to, you know, I'm talking with my, my writers and going, hey, oh, can we do this thing? I'm like, give me five minutes, I make a new data action. Now they can do that anywhere in the story where they can do a data action. So it is not a thing that I'm putting in a particular place, but I'm making it generic enough so that if we give them the poise to go, hey, I want to set my reputation with this other character, fine. I add that in, add that support, and now throughout the entire game, anywhere an action can be performed, the writer can then now use that thing. It's, it's very sort of flexible and polymorphic as, you know, I kind of talked about yes, Um Variables. So for instance, I use a lot of in in-text binding, so character.name, and then you can also do things like, okay, well, as your relationship with someone improves, you may give them a nickname. You know, it may be, you know, oh, Sergeant John whatever, and maybe later he's Ramirez, you know, because, you know, it's, 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 your, it's, your, it's, your, it's your mate, you call him Ramirez, it's kind of cool. And so as the story evolves, that variable can change. And we don't have to change the text. The text is what it is. It says character.name, and then that evolves as the story evolves. So you have capacity to override those variables, override those subsets as the, thing, as the story evolves without actually changing the text. So whether someone has a close relationship with them or a not close relationship with them, it doesn't matter. The story will handle that and evolve with that. Context-based state variables. So what I mean by this is sometimes you only want to save that sort of state or instance based on the universe or the world or the town or maybe even only the conversation. So you need to sort of think about how that information is being saved, how that information is being used and actually thinking about that when you're building a system, how is this information used and how is it relevant? And then player behavior state variables. I talked a bit more about them later, earlier, so I'll kind of stay away from that. Rules. Okay, so I use a generic evaluator that returns a yes or no. Um, it allows you to do an and or an all. So sometimes you can do and rules, you can do all rules, but I also have the capacity to have if, if else, and else all in these, these space rule type. So writers can go, well, if they're friends with Ramirez, I want them to do this thing, but if they're not friends, I want to do this thing. But if they've kind of never met Ramirez, skip this whole section at all. And so the system can cater for that and the, the content will automatic, automatically evolve based on those few settings. So it's kind of how we try to build it to get that reuse and that write at once and the story will evolve as the user uses it rather than necessarily as the, uh, as the writing. So for an example, I, I, I like my Norse mythology. So this is what I would call a sort of a flavor choice. So, you know, Mjolnir is missing and Thor goes to either yell at Loki or threaten Loki. Now, you know, the story continues on as it goes, but later on down the line, Loki can kind of go, oh, you know, just because you assume it's me doesn't mean it is. Or you can say, you know, oh, you don't have to threaten me this time. So you can kind of flavor change that text. So it's referring back to that previous interaction without doing any major branching. It's maybe a one line or a sentence append change that can actually change the experience for the reader quite dramatically without having to do a whole lot of new content. Then you've got the other side, which is the, okay, so to retrieve Mjolnir, Thor will either decide himself as Freya for the wedding party, so if people know the myth, then you know, you've got this. He, he'll reluctantly agree and he'll, he'll end up getting Mjolnir back. Or he'll refuse and he won't. So they're the major branches. So these are generally the way I think about it. Um, the thing about major branches and things you've got to be really careful about is they can get really hefty and really expensive very fast. So having the capacity for flavor 
that can be a bit tricky in terms of it takes a little while for you to get used to kind of going, okay, well, how is this going to change the flavor and the flow? But in terms of the amount of content you have to produce, it's much less than major branches. Major branches can get really expensive really fast. So you use them when you have to and when they're important, but kind of think about whether or not you can get away with creating impact with a sort of flavor change or whether you want a full branch. Now, deployment. How did you build it? How do you do it? <laughs> How do you do it? So, what I want to talk about here, and, and this is kind of the, probably my most embarrassing part of this whole talk. So this, if you're going to be at attention at this point, now get ready to laugh, okay? So we had very limited resources when we set out to build Story Worlds and Story Stylists, and we got by on bare minimums to do our best to build this. It, it's functional, it works, it's live right now, you can go online and play with it, but Story Stylus is an authoring tool that was written in Silverlight, okay? And it exports out to a client, their client app, Story Worlds, which is written in Flash. <laughs> I yeah. still love you. It's okay. Yeah, I, I won't hold it against I you. Know. It's, it, the idea here was that this was a design from five years ago, and because I didn't have the full development team maybe to work on things, uh, I work mainly through co-op students, and because I had a background coming from Zynga, I knew I could teach them how to use Flash, and it's more forgiving for doing certain things. Obviously, as a long-term solution, we're going to be looking at a lot of other things. We're, we're considering Unity and uh, maybe even Unreal Engine. Somebody's talking to me about Unreal right now. I don't know. But there's a saying in entrepreneurship. If you aren't embarrassed by your MVP, your minimum viable product, then you've presented it too late. So a lot of the times, you're just trying to show proof of concept and to get something out there. And, and a lot of times, we're not Unreal, we're not Unity, we have to start from somewhere. And so for me, being able to show that this works and that I have been able to teach eight-year-olds how to build their own interactive content in less than a week shows at least that the concept's there. And now, as a programmer, I can take it and put it into any kind of app and client from there, because the data set is going to stay the same. It's just how we render it. That's all. So the other thing, of course, coming from Zynga, I had to make very clear that my code base was very distinct. So all of the students started that work first so that nobody could sue me later on. So. That's always a good thing to have in mind when you're doing your own engine. Me. So yes. how did I build it? Okay, so for those of you who were here yesterday, um, I used my code-generated data system in Unity with the Unity front end. Um, so I am very much on the data-driven side of things. Flexible, dynamic data systems is kind of my jam. So that was kind of where I started this. I had started building um, that concept um, about a year ago before. Um, in my own time and kind of then built on it um, when we started building this. Um, you know, when you, when you leave a big studio, you go do your fun project, and so that's what I did. Uh, <laughs> binding. So I focused on inline text and variable data binding, so that allows us to transform a sentence quite dramatically without having to rewrite things differently. So people can write in sub-out sections, can say, hey, if they made this choice earlier, just append this other bit rather than that bit, and it kind of swaps it out. And so the player, as they're reading, gets this really sort of interesting, or interacting rather, really interesting interactions with other characters. It kind of goes, hey, that, they, they refer to the thing that I, that I did. And so it starts to feel like their story. It starts to feel like their experience, which is kind of what I was doing, and that's the aim of what I'm doing in kind of building this system. Context using data, uh, data context of the interaction to transform it, so actually changing those things, and I get very context heavy. You'll hear a lot of context, context, context. Um, context is kind of the, the, the frame of the data that is defining the interaction, and then it can change, and as you change the context, so for instance, if you're going on a quest, and I used the example yesterday, so sorry for repeating myself, but if you're going on a quest in a location, and in your, your narrative manager, because I'm always a big fan of having a proper narrative manager in your, in your architecture, um, you go, okay, we're at a point in the game where we need to have this quest, but character or the player is actually over in, uh, over in the desert lands over here, or still in the hinterlands, in the case of Dragon Age, um, and 
you know, the quest was originally written to be over here, but it's a quest that can kind of be at least triggered from wherever. So the system can then go, okay, well, we know NPC, you know, K um, can trigger this quest and he's kind of, or she's kind of standing around doing this thing. So we'll send K to, to, to have a little indicator on them to start sending this player on this quest because they have to do it now. Now, that's based on the context that the player's in, where they are in the world, and the system just goes, cool. It just says, what character sent me on this quest? Character K, excellent. When I finish this quest, I'll go back to character K. Or in the case, you know, you may not have to go back to character K if they die, because, you know, killing people is fun. I mean, killing game people is fun. That didn't come out right. Um, so, you know, as you go through the game, you kind of explore this, and that context can change. So if you have a proper narrative manager and a proper data-driven system, you can actually evolve those things quite quickly without having for the, you know, without the writers having to rewrite the whole quest twice, because you're like, well, what if, what if they're over here? Or maybe you have to write it four or five times. Let's not do that. Let's use variables and context binding to, to write the quest once and just make it work with wherever you need to make it work for. Clean version um, transformation. So I actually have a system that allows me, when the version updates, the data schema number, it will actually allows for a transform if you need to do it. Um, it's very clean because it only transforms the objects that it needs to and ignores the rest. Um, that's really important, particularly when you want to have persistence between story parts, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, and so that becomes incredibly important. Um, and then I also spent a lot of time, because I don't know if any of you have worked in Unity, but text rendering is not its favourite thing in all the world. Um, just as a heads up, if you use Text Mesh Pro, there's a little thing hidden in advance, which is raycasting all your characters. You might want to turn that off. It sucks. And it dramatically helps if you have a lot of text being rendering. So I spent a lot of time um, going through and optimising, uh, rewriting components, because there's particularly things with layout groups and stuff that's really non-performant. Um, so going through and optimising. So part of that whole system was going through and optimising a lot of the text rendering, a lot of those interaction flows, and getting really good at that. Um, and if you want to really know about the, the ins and outs of the data-generated system, um, that talk was recorded yesterday, and so you can look at it later. And the slides are on, you know, if you're on Twitter or whatever, I'm on Twitter, um, I put up the slides as well, so you can always get them from my site. And there's our Twitter down there too. Yes, so yes, there's pixels and words, hashtag, decap hashtag, my Twitter, and the blast. Sweet. Okay, so create a skill level and onboarding. <laughs> I, I know my shame's coming up, so oh, you know, right, it all sounds good, and I know right. my bad's coming up. You're ray tracing your text? Unity does that, just what, be careful. Are you doing reflections on text? Oh, I no, mean, no, like, no, because no, each character is a mesh in Vex Mesh Pro. Are you putting crazy. shadows in there? I mean, no, it's default. It's okay, default. all right, go figure. <laughs> all right, so this is, I mean, you're looking at what Story Stylist looks like. And, and what I wanted to do in this part of the talk is just show you how we're able to get non technical people to be able to. Again, you don't want programmers writing story per se, but you know. Um, so it is very much GUI based. What you see is what you get. And there's data grids in there, given that I'm deploying within a heavy client in Silverlight, you can manipulate and show all this data in some very cool functional ways, which is great when you're trying to crunch and get a game out. But uh, crunch. crunch, I thought I told you this. It happens. <laughs> but I mean, I've done summer camps for kids. We've trained probably about 100 kids um, from ages 8 up to about 16 or so. And they use this tool. And for them to be able to see them sit down, learn the concepts of storytelling, and then have a playable game at the end of the week is amazing. And, and if you're at PAX, you can drop by and we'll show you some of our stuff that we're doing with story, uh, story titles. But even from world building like this, to dialogue trees like this, which again goes into that, how do you maintain your stories? How do you show sort of how easy it is to go through and tweak text like this? Uh, one of the things I think is a big difference sort of your system and my system is you don't have to write all of the different versions. You can use the sort of the variable parameter passing in. I don't do that. I have to write all those different versions because there's a section of localization coming up in a bit, so we'll get to that. But when I see the kids sit down to do dialogue trees, they have so much fun going through 
it's like I turn away for a second, look back, and they've got like four levels of branches, and they're doing all of this dynamic uh, dialogue with their characters. That's where you get to see your story come alive, when you can interact with your characters and really show that kind of dynamic back and forth with your characters. And then further, then when it comes time to do the programming, I, I put this in here just to sort of show how intimidating it can be, but the idea is that once they've created their nouns of their world, then they want to see those nouns come to life. And I think we learn programming best when it's project-based, when you have to solve a problem rather than I'm going to build a website, which tends to be sort of how STEM is taught in, in some places. Um, rather than focus on I'm going to teach you this technology, it's here's what you need to do to be able to make your story come to life. And that works really well for non-technical people, I think, to learn programming. Because you just start them where they're comfortable, and they slowly but make, surely make stuff come alive. The ducky suddenly learns to talk. You can make a dynamite stick explode when you use it. I mean, it's, it's starting simple and then building up from there. So for me, this GUI approach is very important to get non-technical people into creating their own content and telling their own stories, which in the end of the day is what we want to do. So now I get to expose my shame. <laughs> um, so it's important to make all paths valid. So um, one of the things that we have found quite a challenge is depending on whether someone's um, been trained in interactive narrative or whether they're coming from a more linear narrative background, it can be really challenging to get them to understand that if the player chooses not to do this, that is actually a valid choice. And so one of the things when you're actually kind of dealing with your creators and dealing with that sort of thing is actually making sure and validating and actually working with them to go, okay, well, can the player choose not to be friends with Ramirez at all? And if they can, what does that mean? And actually getting people to think about that. So it can be a real challenge to do that. One thing to also be aware is choices have to have an effect in some way. Even if it's later on down the line where you're talking, it's a personality trait expression or something, make sure you have a system to support that. Because having an effect is what gives your story meaning, it's what gives its story impact. It what's, it's what shapes the story and shows your player that it's their story and their experience that you're reflecting. Okay, so when, you know, again, when you're using player stats, make sure that they actually change the content. Um, multiple writers can be really useful sometimes, particularly when you're dealing with going completely different directions. So if you want a, a really angry, hostile kind of character and you want someone a little bit more bubbly, a little bit more kind of, you know, wing it, let, let's be cruisy, um, sometimes actually having different writers go through both the paths can help. Um, particularly if they've get, kind of got a preference for writing one or other. I know I tend to write fairly strong female characters, and so if someone wants a little bit more vulnerable, I kind of struggle, and it doesn't sound as, as compelling, so I tend to have someone else write that side of that kind of feeling or that emotion, because, you know, I'm like, nah, they get up there and they do the thing, and they're like, well, what if they don't want to? You're like, but, but, but they do. So, you know, it's kind of that thing where having other people kind of either gut check or write different paths can give that level of sincerity that you may not have if you're, you're trying to translate the voice. Sometimes it works, but I know I have a very strong writer voice, which, you know, is part of the personality, I think. <laughs> so, in terms of, uh, you know, what I've done, I've investigated a lot of tools, I've explored things, I've talked to writers, and so I have a good idea about what um, my tools uh, should be. Um, you know, I really aim to set up a proper scripting system that can allow, allow writers to test to construct in real time. My favorite um, kind of example of all of these is uh, Ink, Inky. Inky is one of my favorite in terms of being able to test at runtime, play it, run it, kind of it's really nice to kind of get that flow. However, currently <laughs> it's hand editing Jason and, and, and yeah, that, that's a thing. I, <laughs> I, I tend to go a little mad sometimes. So we don't want our writers hand editing. Jay, Jason, just an FYI, they, 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 they love me because I can do things quickly, but they hate me because of this. So, you know, make sure you put your tools up front because 
Otherwise, you get vengeance upon your person. Okay, localization. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll just walk away now. Okay, no problem. <laughs> um, the one thing I think I really liked in your talk there uh, is the choices have an effect. It's not like where a character will remember this for later and it doesn't seem to ever apply to anything else that goes along. So I like that you built that in. Localization. We, when you're telling, I mean, humanity, we're, we're, we all tell stories. And it's great to be able to tell your stories in a worldwide market. Now, for all of the stuff that is handled within Story Stylist, um, I handle everything except video. We're not YouTube yet. But maybe one day. I mean, that's that's uh, you know. But but how it works is there is a layer of everything that you write then can be adapted and tweaked by translators. So if you have a voiceover for a piece of text, that can change and become uh, your translators can give you a different version of that voiceover text for different languages, so that you can. By, by the fact that everything is online and we're working in a cloud-based system, you could be writing and working on parts of your story and your translators could be working in real time and giving you, getting you ready for a global market. Um, and that's something I think that's very exciting, especially because we do want to deliver our stories as, um, to as many people as we can. I think that's a great way to do it. You know that your stories have resonance when they can meet these different audiences. And it's great to be able to have that process. Because I'm doing everything, all those different versions, the translators can do that. Whereas if we had a parameterized approach, I think that we wouldn't be able to do that as well. But you're efficient, so I like that too. So. Well, and that this is where I get to the more uh, <laughs> uh, complicated bit of, bit of my thing. So. This, my whole system relies heavily on dynamic string processing. There, there's a lot of it that happens at runtime as it builds the content because it requires to do that. It uses all of these dot reference contexts and variables as it builds things together. It's really cool. Things in the story can happen and I wasn't expecting. I've had people play test stuff and they're like, oh, this happened and this is really blah, blah, blah. I'm like, wait, what's, what, wait, where was that? Well, I, I didn't, I haven't, ooh, I should, I should know about that. So, you know, that is really cool. Um, it uses a lot of key binding, so currently all my strings are localizable. However, <laughs> because of the way the dynamic content system kind of runs, we um, end up with we end up in another place. So we end up in the Schrodinger's data situation. So, so I had a I had a training a person that was sort of learning up my system, and he's like, you know, you know, you can get to this point where, you know. One person has met one person and they have not met one person. And until the data is observed, it doesn't exist. And so he called it Schrodinger's data. So I have my little, my little cat um, there. So for instance, and this is a really, really, really simplified one. And so in the case of my system, those square brackets means that that text will be removed when the actual sentence is completed. Um, so, you know, you've got a choice. You know, Jay, Juliet chose to go to the beach or the park. Cool. Now, in the actual scripting system, it will say append the whatever that is, or there's, there's multiple ways you can do it, um, and then that's a low key. So oh, I, I don't know whether it was asking for trouble calling all of my localizations low keys, because it just seems like I'm adding mischief into my system. Um, but yeah, so then it evaluates into that, so the player sees, you know, Juliet goes to the park. But as you may have noticed, the way in which the binding and interchanges works rely heavily on the structure of the English language. In, in this case, it's English language, but in the case of um, you know whatever language you're writing in, you use the structures to apply it in that way. So it would apply based on the language that you're writing in, because um, you can put them in and out and around and swap them in and out and all that sort of stuff. So that's that's cool. So whatever language you're writing in, you can actually use the system, but actually localizing the system as it stands, they can technically be localized in the sense that the technology is there, but I doubt it will be structured correctly, particularly in the way that sentence structures happen in English versus, say, German, um, swappings of nouns and verbs and all those sorts of stuff. So it's one of those things that this is really cool and allows people in different 
um, with different sort of cultural backgrounds and languages to write their own stuff in their own way and use the system, but localizing one story from another becomes incredibly complicated because it actually does change a lot of the flows and behaviors. So I am putting that big warning on it um, because of that, because while it is really flexible and dynamic and does all these sorts of things, it is based on the structure of the, the written language that it's in. So that it becomes incredibly kind of difficult to then localize from that point. And if you've um, watched the GDC talk by the guys who wrote Inc, um, they talk about this exact same problem. When you start doing this sort of stuff, it's fine to write it in the language, whatever it is, whichever language you choose to use, but swapping it between can be really difficult, particularly because of the substitution type approach. Innovation and budgeting. Yeah, I mean, for me, it, even it's, it's the gender of what it is that you're putting in changes the whole structure of what you're going to be doing. Yeah. So French translators were always giving me grief about that at EA. So, <laughs> so, so, yeah. um, so I hope at this point you can just sort of see the two different approaches that we've used. We're just taking you through a bunch of different problems that, you know, a storyteller, a writer has to deal with or any kind of interactive storyteller uh, designer. So we're just hitting sort of these big problems and... Um, and telling you we don't do it right either. Yeah. Like, you know, there are challenges that are really hard. Sometimes we do things that work really well for one thing that may not work well for others. And, you know, each of us are solving different problems as we go along, and that's cool. There's no perfect solution on this that we know of. I mean, that's it, it, it's like any other kind of technology, right? So we're hopefully you're getting something out of seeing the different approaches and even if you want to build your own or just sort of are thinking about what are the problems in general for interactive storytelling. So versioning is important because it's got to be easy to use. So what Story Stylist does is you have a base version of your, your interactive story. And that is, you can think of that as like your draft version. You're working on that, that's completely... Only you see that, and that's what you're working on. But you can publish different versions which become deep copies. Now, the pros and cons of this is that there's a lot of data involved in that, and it has to copy over all your media as well, and all your text, but you can treat that as a snapshot of your game. So you can actually see, if you have multiple versions, how your game is evolving and getting better over time. It also means you can continue to work on your base version and your QA or your reviewers can be testing your, your, the versions of your games and you don't have to worry about that you're breaking stuff and they're getting confused. So that's a pretty efficient way for deploying stuff. Um, in our particular system, if you have a reviewer or somebody like a QA, they can look at any version Whereas when you actually publish a live version, your players only see whatever's the most recent. So if you suddenly want to deploy a new version in a new language, you just roll out a new version, and then your players can go from there and deal with, like, they just automatically get that. It's like automatically rolling out your new app version. But, but it's actually done through data. So. so iteration and versioning for me, I come from the free-to-play market. We do a lot of stuff with uh, versioning. We do a lot of stuff with releases of data. You know, that games as a service model has kind of informed this approach quite a lot. Um, I do schema versioning, which is, again, in the generated code, which allows for transforms by object through um, things. We only have one live version at a time, so there is only one live schema version that is active. Things will update as needed. Um, there can be different objects at different points, but there's one, this is the god schema, and if you're out of sync, it'll like to update and kind of, you know, replace it. Um, the deserializer handles, handles that transformation, so if you have player data, player data that is out of date, um, in particular, because that's usually the stuff that's saved on the device that's more likely to cause problems, um, it will do that transform when it loads it up and deserializes it. I use, yep, asset bundles, um, a lot because I'm you know, using Unity, so I you know, version check them for updates. We have a kind of a checker file that checks what's most recent because we, um, I'll talk about that in a bit, but um, how we split up our asset bundles is really important um, and allows us to do that, but that ha version checking becomes incredibly important. We have a, you know, a generated config that allows us to version check based on that. 
Um, we use remote configs and kill switches to push important data changes um, quickly. I'm a big kill switch fan. I had worked on both the client and the server, and when a release went out that broke the game for a whole swathe of players, and I had to work for you know months to go through and manually repair over 200 million records for player save data. Um, and there was no kill switch. I was, let's just say, angry. Um, I, I didn't threaten to kill anyone, I swear. Um, and so having kill switches becomes really important, particularly when it could break someone's play experience quite pro you know, badly. Um, I'm a programmer. I use source control. Because all of our stuff is saved in JSON, it's text-based, it allows us to roll back. It allows us to see, it allows us to merge. So if you really have, you know, ideally you have it sectioned off so you don't have two people, you know, working on the same file at once, but because it is text-based, you can merge it. Um, and so you can actually sort of do that. Um, bi binaries are builds only. Binaries can't merge, they suck. Um, so yeah, builds only. I don't deal with them in the source control sort of system. <sighs> Rapid development, okay. episodic stories. All right, we're, we're getting down towards the end here and I want to just sort of say that I put a little bit of surprise in here in the sense that I think where this is going in terms of narrative storytelling and, and interactive design and, and being building tools for narrative design, I think this is the future. And the reason for that is because you want to be able to create content quickly. And so what I try to do is create an object-oriented approach for designing the narrative data. And I think this is where things are going to go. You want to try to abstract out as much of your system from the actual stories that you tell, and so that you can make things very reusable. So when it, so in the sense that at the most abstract, you have the rule set, which becomes the time period or setting, or the time period for your particular story. And then you have a setting where you put your story. Um, then your story then inherits from all of that other content. So when you want to create a new story in that setting, it becomes easy to just roll out a new iteration as if you were creating a new class because you automatically inherit that whole real, real set and all of the characters and locations of that setting. That makes collaborative storytelling incredibly powerful because you can all be working and sharing the work on that setting to tell your story. It would be as if you have a team of writers building up your Gotham universe, but you're each working on your own individual Batman comic book or graphic novel. What's also great about this is it allows you to take a character from a story and then promote them up to the setting so that everybody can then share and use that character. So that Harley Quinn character who's suddenly very popular, make it available to everyone else so they can use and tell that character tell stories with that character in that setting. I think that's a very elegant way for you to have that reuse and also to work almost as a setting Bible for all of your writers within that world. It's a way to guideline, but also allows you to create content very quickly. And then really to blow your mind is not only would you inherit from the rule set and the setting, but why not inherit from other stories? So all of the choices and the variables that you're creating with each story as it goes along, save those settings so that you can have those choices impact over multiple episodic stories. I think this is really incredible because I think we've seen it done within Mass Effect and, and games like that, but I think there's a lot more potential here that we can do because I think we can even have chains of stories where they are all told within a universe imagine like a Marvel cinematic universe in that sense where the consequences of one story then impact several stories from there and all maybe combined into like an Avengers movie and whatnot. It's, this is going to be really powerful and allows you to create levels of branching narrative that no other media can do. I can't wait to see where we go with this. So I've gone a little bit, you know, I like to make sure that we have uh, code-free additional content, so you can add content without actually having to add code. Um, that's because of the data-driven functionality. I'll, I will harp on this for the rest of eternity. Um, 
and I use CDN, so that's Content Delivery Networks uh, so the Service data, data, uh, data Updates that will then evaluate and then update. Um, and the reason I can do that is because I have contextual asset bundle building. So each section of a, you know, a story or a level or a world is built based on its content. So, hey, you want to update a new thing? It will add it to that chain. The book, you know, base information will update and you'll add a new contextual. So you say, hey, you know, this world, we're adding a new area. Cool. The, the world data will update. You'll add one more asset bundle for the assets and one more asset bundle for the data. And then suddenly that whole new area is accessible. Um, and that allows for quite quickly doing episodic content. It, oh my God, it, um, it allows us to stream additional content, but it also means that we can kind of allow us to schedule ourselves between major releases and content releases. And the reason that's important is because A, I am a big no crunch person. Um, and so we can schedule things out properly. We can be aware of people working on alternate cadence because content is king. Content or queen, you know, whichever way you want to go with that. Um, users want content and want it content regularly. They'll come back if you have regular releases of content. So you want to alternate your cadence between your major releases that have big code changes, that has big feature improvements, and your content releases, which may be literally your weekly next chapter of this thing or next area of this world to explore or next new character, you know, profile that you want to, you know, go with. However, you're doing that, you want to have a regular cadence of content release. And so actually setting it up to allow you to do this and having them alternated, so having the code versus content releases out of sync is really, really important. Okay, so we well, got to get fast. Yeah, no, it's, okay. it's, we're just wrapping up here. Okay, so cool. the big thing for testing is that, remember, whenever you build a tool, you want your users to be able to maintain and use it effectively at runtime. So we've created a menu here that's only within the game settings. Only authors can see this or if you're in the base version. And then what it allows you to do is to walk through your scripts in real time and see what is happening and what values are being returned. To be able to see at any given moment what, are the, what is the current state of the world and what messages have you shown the player. Um, and this one I'm really happy about is a recent feature where you can save the current state of the game as data, as a script, so that then you can have, if you know you're reaching a bugged portion of your game, you can automatically restore based on calling a script and also do that in runtime to be able to see and walk through and tweak your scripts if something broke. So giving, being able to iterate fast and being able to test and see where the problems lie is going to save you a lot of problems. So, so yes, um, this is another slightly difficult bit of the conversation for me. So currently, we do have save game restore and vary manipulation. So that, that all works. You can, you can save where you're at. You can restore it. You can go with it. You can change your variables. That, that's, that, that's good. Um, however, I, I, at the moment, it's mostly manual testing. And, and I thought you thought you'd get away with no, no you know, supernatural gifts. Well, you were wrong. <laughs> And so this makes me very sad. The plan is to have proper data validated, build integrated, so you can actually validate data. Data is data. You can trace through the trees. You can trace through the you know, choice paths pretty straightforward. So you can do that at build time. You can go, hey, traverse the trees. Oh, wait, we've hit a dead branch. Boop, build fail, and then you can go fix it. Um, and you can have a validator tool as well to do the same, same thing. Um, and then also additional unit integration testing. All of this stuff is in the plan at the moment. I'm very sad. <laughs> okay. At least you're in unity, though. Yes, that's true. At least I'm in <laughs> unity. Um, so conclusions. This is kind of a point where we wanted to say that, you know, as creators of narrative content, the world, what we're creating is, is up to you. And we want to give you a bit of a kind of a one second, two second um, <laughs> breakdown of where we want to go with our narrative or narrative in general. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think going into that, uh, the rapid iteration thing of being able to deliver episodic content very quickly and to be able to work with a team of people live in creating and telling stories. Uh, I can't wait to sort of see where this goes, maybe even in terms of licensed fan content, 
where you would buy a kit from a major um, IP, and then you would be able to create and tell stories within Ooh, that no, IP. No, fan fiction animations is not a thing. That's no. not a thing. <laughs> <laughs> you got the supernatural gift up there. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to tell a story with Sam? Oh, no, no, no. No, no, I've seen that part of the internet. <laughs> <laughs> but I think there's something there where you can actually have a marketplace for this kind of content. And not even just, even if you did want to sell it, it's just you get to use and play, you know, with your favorite characters and favorite worlds. So for me, and that's, and that, all of that stuff applies to me, but what I really want to see, and I want to think that all of us as content creators can do, you know, writers and technologists, is creating meaningful stories, like exploring the world from different perspectives, exploring things in different ways, solving problems in different ways, reaching out to different, you know, supporting and building stories that say things differently, that explore things differently, that expose different experiences. Because what story really and truly is, at our, at our very heart, is an exploration of what it means to be human. It's our way of exploring the world as we know it. And we have a responsibility to explore that in as many ways as possible. No better time to do that now with interactive. Yes. Yes. Questions, and I'm not sure how much time we have. Five minutes. Slow. Also, I just want to say thank you to the Ontario Crates for allowing me to be here. I'm a Canadian in your country. Thank you very much for all the kindness you've shown me, and good day. Yes. So questions. Any questions? No questions? Yes? Well, I'm a big fan of uh, modular-driven storytelling, so where you have discrete modules and units of storytelling that can be moved around and that actually mean different things depending on how you interact with them. So, you know, they can... You know, one of the things that we kind of miss out a lot in, in storytelling and particularly in interactive is player perspective actually makes a huge difference. So if they interact with one character first, he goes, this character, they're, they're really bad. They're a bad, you know, bad person. They do all these horrible things and, you know, we need to go hunt them down. And, but if you go to the other person first, they go, oh, no, 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 that person. And you can kind of, that will shape their experience. So that's a modular-based system. I am still a fan of authorial content. I think that AI and any of that sort of generative stuff is not yet at a point where it can really grasp meaning and synthesis in a way that we can as people. And the way in which we synthesize knowledge and explore synthesized knowledge is uniquely based on authorial kind of exploration. So I think modular narrative can work, which in the sense that you have these authored kind of units of, of meaning that can then be interchanged and explored and mean different things when they're reordered. But I don't think we're actually at a point where we can get away from that because I think true meaning comes from that. I know there's a lot of research being done on whether or not AI can tell stories. And my real response to that is, why would you want to? There are so many writers out there who have stories, who have different perspectives, who should be given a voice and given access to the ability to create interactive content. Um, yeah, does that, does that help? I mean, I like being able to build these modules of t code or tools and then let writers go from there and come up with new and inventive stories to tell. Okay, I think we're, are we, are we out? Yes, we're out of time. We'll, we'll, be, we'll, okay. we'll, we'll be out, we'll be here, and I will be chaired, and then we can you know, see the here or there, and we can actually then um, answer some more questions and have some more discussion. Always happy to talk about interactive narrative. Thank Always you so much work. for attending. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um,